interpretations of Islam present in North India itself. Now when they were faced with the Hindus, I mean now here that's a motley crowd as well. You have Hindus that might be Brahmins, but on the other hand you have Hindus living just 200 meters away up in the forests. They may be regarded as Hindus today, but they were way beyond the pale of civilization for the Hindu Brahmins. They were what you would call today untouchables, but more likely Aborigines. But it was not until 1186 AD that Islam arrived in the Indian heartland. Under the leadership of Mohammed of Gur, Muslims from Turkey and Afghanistan swept across the country, slaughtering the forces of the Rajputs in bloody battles. By 1206, Mohammed had reached the Bay of Bengal, but in the same year he died. His successor, Qutbi Uddin, inherited a substantial empire, which he decided to rule from a long-established Indian city. Qutbi Uddin now became the Sultan of Delhi. In many ways, the city of Delhi typifies the Indian story as a whole. It is a heady mix of the ancient and the modern. One of the city's finest monuments proves that the Muslims wasted little time before making an architectural impact. This is the Qutbi Dinar, a tapering tower that is just one feature of a huge complex of mosques and other religious buildings. But it is this 260-foot high monument that is the first Sultan's most enduring achievement. Now a World Heritage Site, this building is an early example of a fusion of Islamic and Indian architecture. If you look at it today, there could be no stronger iconoclastic statement. This was a mosque made out of 27 ruined temples. The people who constructed this mosque were all Hindu craftsmen. The presence of a Muslim architect or a Muslim master perhaps telling the Hindu craftsmen, saying, this is what I would like as a statement of my belief. And the Hindu craftsmen saying, well, if you would like this as a statement of your belief, this is the manner my hand can craft it for you. You don't find any element of what art and architectural historians will call the Saracenic arch, the true arch. It's absent there. Instead, what you have is a cobbled arch, an interweaving of stone placed parallel to the ground. Now, this was a tradition of construction which was popular in the local neighborhood. This mosque was then destroyed by Muslims. So Qutbuddin made the mosque, his successor renovated it. About 80 years down the road, another Sultan came and he thought this mosque was not quite good enough. He renovated it once again. Each time the mosque was renovated, the old constructor was forgotten. And each Sultan was again making the statement that this is in fact my mosque. Just like the Muslims who first came in said that the temples are not the places of worship, but my mosque is the place of worship. Succeeding Muslim sultans came and said, the old mosque is not good enough, mine is much better. Other sultans followed the first sultan's example, building more monuments and creating new capitals, each one trying to make his mark. Early in the 14th century, the sultan Giyas Uddin Tukluk decided to move his capital from Delhi to a new location named after himself. This was Tuklukabad, a site half a mile square, enclosed by walls up to 90 feet high. At moments of political stability that occurred in the medieval period, occurred at times when the Hindu Raja, the Rana, and the Malik, or the Muslim Amir, the Muslim commander, combined. The technical superiority, or the theoretical superiority, seniority, military worth of one would not be challenged by the other. This was mutually acceptable. And at the same time, that there would be commercial interchange between the two political realms. The two political realms would be autonomous up to as far as possible. They would cooperate in military ventures. They would not harbor enemies. There's a certain discourse that is created around this time period, a discourse of conquest, not just over the Hindus, but a discourse of conquest where the court, the Muslim, the court of the Sultan, hegemonizes the disparate groups of people who go by the name of being Islam, of being Muslim. Once the discourse gets to be created that they are one community under the umbrella and the protection of the Delhi Sultan, then you have, for the first time, the consolidation of an image of what it means to be a Muslim. By this time, the simulation of Indian and Hindu and Islamic motifs is already a tradition that is well-established and is occurring at various scales. 
you see this at the level of the city, wherein you have a host of new cities, and certainly Tuglakabad is an early Sultanate edifice at that level. So there's a whole urban tradition there, the nature of kind of laying out a mosque, a great Madani Shah, a whole host of objects or edifices that dot the Islamic edifice, which indeed gives place to earlier pre-existing Hindu ones. So you have a great urban tradition. Despite the strength of the structure, the new city was soon abandoned. The city had been built in response to a threat which had now become a reality. The threat came from an Asian warrior nation who had already conquered a huge area of the planet and who now sought to expand into the Indian heartland, the Mongols. At the end of the 14th century, the Mongols arrived in India with a vengeance. Under the leadership of Timurlane the Great, Mongol forces rode from the Punjab and sacked the city of Delhi. A hundred thousand may have been massacred during the enterprise. Delhi itself was looted of its treasure, its craftsmen and skilled workers carried off into slavery. But this booty was all Timurlane was interested in. In 1399, he withdrew from India, leaving the first of a series of weak sultans in charge. Ultimately, it was one of Timurlane's descendants who would make a far greater impact on the story of India. In the year 1526, he arrived with a new invasion force from the north. Though Turkish, this military leader claimed a direct bloodline from the Mongol leaders Timurlane and Genghis Khan. His name was Babur. His Mongol bloodline gave rise to the name of the dynasty that he founded, the third of the great ruling dynasties of India, the Mughals. The Mughals were, were Muslims, but the early Mughals were not at all fanatical about this. They just happened to be Muslims, and they didn't really try to impose their religion on the population. In fact, they tried to integrate as much as possible. The great Mughal emperor Akbar, in fact, took wives from Hindu chiefs, and the children were then Muslim, but the idea was to integrate with the existing population. It's only with the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb in the late 17th century that we find less toleration of other religions in India. The problem with the Mughal Empire was it never managed to unify the whole of India. And there were always continuing wars on the frontiers. The other problem under the Mughals, whenever a Mughal Emperor died, there was a war of succession. And usually the most powerful son was the one who managed to uh, gain power in the end and then try to re-establish the rule. The Mughals are the culmination, I think, of India's greatness. It's a strange thing that there, it was an Islamic dynasty and India is really predominantly a Hindu country. But this is one of the things of India. It's never simple. The Mughals did more in terms of organisation and control of a large amount of Indian territory and a generation of enormous tax revenues uh, to create a massive standing army and a very sophisticated civilization than anybody. Akbar himself, the third Mughal emperor, instituted massive tax reforms, land reforms, to make sure that his state was able to collect tax and he used that money to build the Mughal Empire into what it became. The great Mughal was known around the world, Elizabethan England and Europe, widely respected as probably the wealthiest ruler anywhere on the surface of the planet. The Mughal Empire lasted until 1857. During that time the territory under their control expanded to include virtually all of the Indian Peninsula. Mughal rulers such as the great Akbar were not only brilliant commanders, but wise and generous rulers, like the Mauryans and the Guptas of the ancient past. Akbar especially encouraged a tolerant and fair system of government in his kingdom. The farmers in India, they responded very quickly to the demand for products outside, and particularly cotton. They also began to grow new crops which came in, originally brought by the Portuguese, and crops often seen as being very typically Indian, like chili. India was a land with massive population of artisans, particularly the handloom weavers, who were found all around the port cities of India, producing uh, cotton cloth, and other textiles such as silk. It was a very big transport trade in India. And this involved largely the carrying of goods on the backs of 
uh, animals, particularly bullocks. The peasantry were very responsive to the needs of the market.